Welcome to another exciting episode of Knife Chats with Tobias, Almost Live. This episode was recorded in front of a live studio audience. Well, it was recorded in front of a live cat. Any case, hope you enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Uh, Tobias here. And, well, it's an Almost Live with Knife Chats with Tobias. So I guess I'm the one who should be here. This is for April 2021, and if you notice, you're not looking right away at my uh, workbench, and that's because I figured what I would do is I would start off this almost live by looking at some of my fixed blade knives. Um, my fixed blades don't get a lot of love on the channel, it seems, and I, I thought maybe this would be a way to do that. So let me know if you like the idea of me starting off uh, my almost lives by showing off some of the fixed blades I have. And uh, I will do that if, if you think it's a good idea. And I will also try and get back to doing some of the other uh, fixed blade knives that I've been wanting to get around to, especially finishing off my uh, uh, Air Force survival knives. I've got a couple of them that I still need to do videos on and just haven't gotten around to doing. But I'm going to start this one with a, a knife that if you uh, look at the uh, YouTube community page that I have on, on Knife Chats with Tobias, you might have seen a picture of this one already. I've also posted it, I believe, on a couple of the Facebook pages that I subscribe to. And it's this one right here, the uh, Colt uh, CT7 Serengeti Skinner. Um, I never did a review on this knife when I first got it. I've had this knife for well over 11 years. Uh, it was made, uh, well, it's made in China, um, and this was one of those knives uh, that was made by Smoky Mountain Knife Works when they had the uh, the license to use the Colt trademark for for their for knife production. Um, they they made a lot of pocket knives. They also made quite a few of the fixed blades. A lot of the fixed blade Colts were made in Pakistan. Uh, this one happened to be made in China, uh, but the, if if you had a Colt uh, Damascus fixed blade that came out of uh, that was made during the time of Smoky Mountain Knife Works, it came out of Pakistan, uh, and it, the equivalent knife in stainless steel would have also been coming out of Pakistan. I'll show you one of those in a second too, but let's start off with the Serengeti Skinner here because a lot of people saw that one and thought it was pretty cool. And uh, it is a pretty cool knife, but it does have, at least for me, it does have one fatal flaw. Two, if you include the sheath. First, the sheath from the front side. Ooh, excuse me. Polish sausage, I think. Anyway, from the front side, the sheath is great. The back side, not so much. Uh, it's got one of those just flaps there, and it's very tight. I've never used the sheath. I've never carried the knife. Uh, well, and I'll explain why in a little bit. There's more than one reason why I have not carried it. Uh, you could get a belt in there, I guess. But I would have much rather it just been a loop. And there is enough leather on there because there's two layers of leather there that they could have actually put a loop into that sheath rather than putting this piece of a uh, leather strap there. Even though it does say Colt there. You also got the... Rampart, rampant, rampart horse there, whatever you want to call it, right there on the sheath. Nice embossing and everything. And you got the uh, little metal tab there for the snaps. Two snaps hold it in place because of how funky the blade is. You saw how easy it comes out of the sheath. And there you have the knife. The knife is a uh, 10 inches overall length, four and a half inch blade and a five and a half inch or so handle. Uh, this is the CT7Z, the Z standing for zebra wood. The CT7 just had a pack of wood handle. Uh, I went the extra couple bucks and grabbed it in zebra wood, uh, which, well, I like zebra wood better than pack of wood. And this one, uh, fairly well matched, I guess. It looks really nice. Really like the handle, the way the handle looks. You got the little uh, Colt uh, pen in there. Or shield in there. You see the Colt uh, logo on the blade and then on the back side here. Here we go. Um, C 
CT7Z and stainless steel. The blade is 440A stainless steel. And uh, I guess you could say it is a harpoon style blade because you got the little thumb ramp going there. And then you got this massive gut hook up here. And, uh, and then a, otherwise a wide belly skinner. And it's a nice hollow grind going on with the blade and everything. And it is sharp. Uh, not the most pointy one. Kind of almost like a tracker style front when you think of it. But you got a big old gut hook there uh, on the top there too. Or you could use it for cutting branches almost too if you wanted to. And so what's my... I said there was a flaw with the knife. It's right here. See that uh, finger groove? Well, if you're Magilla Gorilla, this knife is going to fit your hand great. Notice my hand, though. This is right where the finger groove would be. Notice how far back from the... Uh... I hate when that happens. Yeah, just had to pause for a while. Notice how far back from the guard my hand is. I would rather have my hand up by that guard so that I can get my thumb up into the blade like that when I'm cutting down and everything. But when I do that, you see where my fingers run. My middle finger is right on the bump there. If that bump were not there, if this was just smooth all the way, I could position my hand anywhere along that handle that I wanted to. But because of this bump, it just makes it awkward for me to hold the knife so the only way i can really take care of that is if i had a grinder and i could grind all that out and uh well i don't have a grinder that can do that i'm not going to give it to someone else to do it and uh, but if i were going to have to if i decided i was going to be using this knife a lot that's what i would have to do i'd have to grind that bump out of there because it just drives me nuts i've got plenty of other knives to use so this one basically became a wall hanger simply because of that bump there. Um, now, other people, people with a Magilla Gorilla hand, you know, somebody with a large hand, they're going to say, man, that knife feels great in my hand. Somebody with smaller hands than mine, they, they might actually say, that's okay, I don't have a problem with it. I get two fingers in there with no problem. But for me... My finger is right on that bump, and it makes it very uncomfortable to hold. Uh, and that is a problem with the knife, uh, at least for me. But otherwise, as you can see there, you got brass pins holding on the uh, zebra wood handle. Got a nice uh, brass lanyard tube in the back there. And uh, looks like a very functional blade. I could definitely see myself hacking stuff up with it. But it just isn't comfortable for me to hold, so... Uh, it's kind of a killer deal for it. Love the way it looks. It's just out of proportion for my hand. Uh, still though, it seems to me that uh, Smoky Mountain Knife Works should take this knife and move it into the uh, Rough Rider lineup, the uh, Serengeti Skinner, because I know it was popular at the time. It sold out extremely quickly. Uh, and uh, it is on high demand. When people try to get it these days, uh, it's not cheap. It wasn't cheap when it came out either. I, well, probably was cheap. Um, it was in the $25 range or so, something like that. Um, but compared to Rough Rider knives that were going for $12, $13, it wasn't cheap. But uh, I could see this one making it into the uh, Rough Rider lineup. But if you do that, Smoky Mountain Knife Works, how about reprofiling that handle a little bit? Because then it would even sell better. As it is, uh, with a reprofiled handle, I would buy it again. If the handle were the same, I wouldn't recommend buying it unless you got large hands. Uh, let's move over to another knife uh, that I got that uh, actually has almost the exact same problem. Now before I show the next one, let me show you two other knives. Uh, one of them is my little Ulu Skinner. I believe I did a, a video on this one before. If I didn't, I should. It's also out of production now. This is the R776 Ulu Skinner by Rough Rider. 
and you see what it is it's a little wide belly skinner with a small handle and they sometimes call it a palm skinner or such uh, and I really like these knives this one is really cool it has again a zebra wood handle and uh, this one is held on by um, little torque screws so you can actually remove the handles to clean the knife and I use this one actually quite often for cutting up stuff I like to use this one for not only cutting fish but also cutting frozen food around the house and everything else because it is uh, a good knife for the kitchen got a nice hollow grind going on there got a little swedge on the top there the finger groove is unnecessary again 448 stainless steel but you can actually get up there and cut it multiple ways of holding it and everything and you got enough handle uh, to do what you need to do with it so it feels good in the hand got another one of those this one here is by uh, Fox and Hound this is also a Rough Rider brand this one was made in Pakistan this one was made in China this one has a uh, pack of wood and stag handles and again it's like an Ulu Skinner or Palm Skinner whatever you want to call it got a little jimping up on top there and multiple ways to hold it and again just a great little knife for cutting bait and stuff and also for just food prep so these are a kind of knife that I like to collect as well as use I've got multiples of these um, one two three four five probably seven or eight variants of this knife frost makes one they that he calls the snook excellent knife you know what let me go grab a snook while I'm at it. All right, this one is not actually made by Frost. It's made by Bone Collector, but it is the same knife as uh, the Frost Snook. And uh, you can see what it looks like. It's got the finger hole up front there. Yeah, like you're going to be doing something like that. This is not a karambit of any kind. But you got a nice swell back here, and your hand fits it really nicely. You got the very aggressive jumping up on top so you can get your finger on there and hold it nice and tight uh, this part here is for actually cutting off fins and cutting through bone and such this is just a nice swedge on the top here and then you've got the front part for cutting up stuff and as you can tell yes I have used it even though it is a knife in my white smooth bone collection these are knives that I really like to use and like the well also like to collect and that brought me to, I really need to get a nice palm skinner, one made in the United States. And so I went out and I started looking for one made in the United States, and I found one. And now for a brief word from our sponsors. It's not a rumor. The new stickers are in. The brand new Knife Chats with Tobias stickers featuring Kitty are in stock. They will be available very soon for the low, low price of $3 each, uh, $4 for international sales. These high quality vinyl stickers are made by the good folks at Rockin' Monkey and measure two inches by three inches and feature the beautiful, lovely kitty on there. So if you wanna join the Hep Cat crowd and have your own Knife Chats with Tobias sticker, contact us at knife.chats at yahoo.com. Kitty promises you won't be disappointed. What do you think of the show so far? Was that a yes or a no? We now return to our show. So as I was saying, I wanted a USA Palm Skinner, and I wanted it so that I could use it in uh, both in food prep and also uh, if I were to take it out and use it for cutting bait and such like that. So I wanted a well-made, USA-made Palm Skinner. And uh, I started looking around, and I saw two options out there that I liked, both by the same company. and. Uh, I might have made the wrong choice but in any case the company was right there tops uh, and the knife I picked up was the wolf pup XL and uh, well let's take it out of the sheath it's got the nice kydex sheath with the uh, 
little revolving uh, belt clip so you can hook it on any way you want to. And obviously it came with the top's whistle. And it fits into the sheath nicely. Locks in there, it doesn't fall out or anything. Uh, so you can see how smoothly it comes out. Pretty heavy. You got the micarta handle held on by Torx screws. Uh, I wanted something where the handle could uh, be removed. And you've got the uh, 1095 carbon steel blade with the black coating over it. And you see right there, Topps Wolf Pup XL. And as soon as I got it, it was like, man, that looks great. And then as soon as I held it in my hand, it's like, this feels kind of weird. And, uh, and that's where the mistake came in. I probably should have stuck with the Wolf Pup instead of the Wolf Pup XL. Now let me explain the difference between the two. This one is about seven and a half inches long, seven inches long, something like that. Let's see here. Yeah, seven and a half inches long with a cutting edge that is about uh, three and a quarter inches. Now, the Wolf Pup is only about five and a quarter inches long uh, and it has a much smaller blade about a two inch blade and that's why I decided I would go with this one instead because I wanted the larger blade um, but what they did with this was they took the wolf pup and they basically stretched it out and when they did that do you see this uh, front finger groove how large it is makes your hand want to grab it way back here uh, and if you have your hand way back there then your thumb goes right in the right spot for the uh, for the thumb groove here or for the little thumb ramp fits really nicely but then you got the blade way out here and it just doesn't feel right because you want the blade right there but then when you pull your hand up against the uh, the blade the thumb ramp is out of place. Uh, stretching the knife just didn't really work too well because now the thumb ramp should be way up over here and if they'd have done that it might have felt better but the other problem I have is the location of that bump for the finger groove um, basically it hits my finger right there if I'm holding it where I want to hold it it's hitting my finger in a very odd spot so it pushes my hand all the way up against the blade and that doesn't feel comfortable either. So there's no way for me to grip this nice comfortably. I guess that's what I'm really trying to say. And because I can't hold it comfortably, I never carry it, I never use it. Uh, matter of fact, all I have ever done is try to find a way to hold this knife comfortably and grip it so that I can use it. So I've never actually even cut anything with it simply because it doesn't feel right in the hand. Uh, a lesson learned, an expensive lesson on top of that. And so I keep thinking, man, I wish I would have picked up the Wolf Pup instead of the Wolf Pup XL. Uh, but, you know, after you bought this and they're not cheap, it's like, do I really want to risk buying another top Knife that may also not feel comfortable in my hand. So I've got to find the Wolf Pup in person before I'm even going to try and buy it. And uh, the thing is, is this is the second Topps knife I've bought and neither one of them I carry because they're just not comfortable for me to carry. Um, and typically it has something to do with the shape of the handle. It's like, I don't know where they come up with the shape of the handles. They, they look cool but looking cool and feeling comfortable are two entirely different things. Um, and so uh, I guess that's why this is only my second Topps knife. Um, and so <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I'm guessing um, the t big top fans out there are probably saying, well, your inability to, to pick the right knife is no reason to rag on Topps. And I agree with you on that point. But the thing is, is uh, I'm 0 for 2 with Topps Knives. And um, what do you say to that? I mean, 
Am I, I'm picking up the wrong Topps knife? If I'm picking up the wrong Topps knives, then Topps is making the wrong type of knife. Um, maybe they shouldn't be making palm skinners if they don't know how to make a correct handle. That could be my argument back to the, the fanboys that are saying that I'm just picking up the wrong knives. In any case, I don't want to turn into this uh, turn this into a rant against Topps, but it is something that um, we run the risk of when we're buying knives online because we can't hold them beforehand. Uh, and all you can do is basically look at something and go, is that going to feel comfortable in my hand or not? And sometimes you can't tell that from a picture. And um, if a knife doesn't feel comfortable, if it feels too heavy, if it feels too light, there's all sorts of reasons why a knife ends up just being something that is left in a drawer and never used. Um, and even a well-made quality knife that doesn't feel comfortable in the hand um, is really nothing more than a paperweight because if you're not going to use it, what's the point? So I'm still on my quest for a USA made palm skinner that I actually like. Okay, honest, I, I am going to turn this uh, this camera around and get onto the bench, but I just remembered one more thing. Uh, I had mentioned a Colt knife that was made in Pakistan, and well, here it is. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the old Colt knives that were made in Pakistan. Uh, for the most part, a lot of them were Damascus, but just about every Damascus knife that Colt made also had a stainless steel version. And the, the difference is the stainless steel version was normally in 420 stainless steel if it was coming out of Pakistan. If it was coming out of China, it was 440A stainless steel. That was the general rule. Um, and this one here is the, uh, uh, I believe this is the CT406. There was also a CT405. The difference being the CT406 had a wood handle and the 405 had a, um, a stag handle. And both of them basically have a rat tail tang. This one, the rat tail tang does not go all the way through. The one on the uh, CT405, the, uh, the stag handle, it goes all the way through and then it's held on the, on the back with a little brass hex knot. Um, I did not really, I had both of them at one time, both of them in stainless steel. I did not pick up either one of them in, um, in Damascus. In any case, both of them had the same, if you see there, the, uh, the guard with the file worked guard with the two brass uh, slabs on either side and both of them had the same wide belly blade, uh, same exact wide belly blade on the Damascus knives too, except they were in Damascus instead of 420 stainless steel. Um, and the stag handle had a slight bend to it. Um, I ended up giving away the stag handled one in a giveaway on my channel um, what, four or five years ago and that actually uh, really got me so aggravated that I, I stopped doing videos for a while because uh, I gave it away to somebody and then all they did was complain about getting a crappy knife as a giveaway. It's like, you know, seriously, if you knew what the knife was going to be in the giveaway to begin with, I'm giving you a free knife and then you complain when you get it because you were expecting something better. I told you exactly what it was. Uh, no surprises. Uh, but, you know, after that one, I had another ungrateful giveaway. And I was like, I'm done with this. What was the point? Uh, I'm glad I've, I got over it. I, in any case, man, am I ranting a lot today? I swear, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Probably not the best day to be doing my almost life. In any case, I really kept this one because I really liked it a lot. And uh, I liked the uh, the wood handle. I liked the little brass uh, nails on the back there. I liked the little peasant cross going on with it and everything. It was just a really cool knife. And uh, I took this one out and I actually, as you can tell, I beat the crap out of it. 420 stainless steel. Uh, still has a decent enough edge. I've sharpened it a couple times, and uh, as you can tell, I've also cleaned it up a little bit. Uh, it used to say Pakistan right over here. It is rubbed off uh, just from getting cleaned up and everything. 
used to also, I think, say CT406 here, uh, but it was just laser pad stamped on there, so it disappeared as I cleaned it as well. Um, but the uh, the Colt, that was nicely uh, engraved in there or, or stamped in there nice and deep, so you got the uh, Anaconda C Colt on there. Uh, nice straight handle, fits the hand nice. You got a nice little uh, place for your thumb there. You can grab it like so. I've actually uh, cut branches off of a tree by hacking through it with this. So, you know, I actually took it out and, and beat the crap out of it a little bit. I think I got a picture of it somewhere with me jamming it into a tree just to see how well it would uh, poke stuff. So, um, really just a, a fine little knife, even though it is just a 420 steel blade. Uh, and it is also interesting that I preferred a 420 steel over Pakistani Damascus. So there you have it. And you know what? I still prefer 420 steel over Pakistani Damascus. Um, I trust it more. Any case, now for sure, let's turn the camera around and get to the workbench. Okay, before we go to the workbench, I wanted to uh, take a look at this old March 2013 catalog from Smoky Mountain Knife Works and show you this Colt Alamo Bowie. I had this knife for a while. I gave it away uh, because I had a friend who collected uh, large fixed blades and I thought he had liked this quite a bit. But I wanted to show you primarily is the price of this knife back in 2013, the Alamo Bowie which sold for $24.99. And now let's jump ahead to 2021. The knife is currently out of stock, but you can see here the Rough Rider Bowie knife with the wood handle, which is nearly identical to that Colt Alamo Bowie. The only difference is, is it's missing the little stars on the guard and it has a different tank stamp. Plus it's $5 cheaper. Otherwise, it is truly the same knife. Made in Pakistan, still using 420 steel. Everything about this knife is the same. What's the main difference? The tank stamp. So Smoky Mountain Knife Works was paying a licensing fee to use the Colt uh, trademark, and they passed that on to you. Same knife, lower price. What can I say? It's the difference between name brand and store brand. I also collect playing cards. This is a, a reproduction deck of old time uh, Faro cards. They were also used for poker, but these would have been the ones used back from uh, around the Civil War up until around the 1900s or so. You know, Old West kind of cards. And notice they look quite a bit different than uh, what you see with modern cards today. Let's see here. Anyway. They're also not as easy to shuffle, but they're still kind of fun. And uh, if you're doing in, if you're into reenacting and you're doing Old West, these are the kind of cards that you would want to have, not modern cards like you see in uh, Maverick on television and stuff like that. These are the period correct kind of cards. Anyway. Let's see what the top card is. Queen of Diamonds. Some of you know what's going on. Okay, welcome to the workbench for this uh, April's Almost Live. And what I'll probably be doing mostly here is uh, answering a couple uh, uh, viewer comments as well as showing off a few of the new knives that I picked up that probably will not get a a real review so um, and I'm going to start off with the uh, OSS knife that I joked about yeah this is my April Fool's knife and a couple people actually asked um, who actually made this knife and I can tell you right away I have no idea I'm assuming that it was made sometime um, around World War II 
any time between 1930 and 1960, I guess. I really have no idea. It does have a nice brass bolster up on top, and it is a solid, well-made knife. However, as you can see here, it has actually no markings on it whatsoever. That part is true. Uh, there was no tang stamp on this knife or anything, but uh, it is a knife I bought about 10 years ago. And if you notice, it's nice and straight there. And uh, it's just a really good, solid knife. Um, great action on it. Fantastic half stop. But um, it was sold um, without any tank stamp markings on it. And believe it or not, this is not uncommon. Uh, my bet is it was probably some store brand or something, and uh, the store just didn't pay to have the tank stamp marked on it. And this is not uncommon. Uh, so once you get it out of the packaging, uh, there's actually no markings on it to tell you anything about the knife. And if you don't have the packaging, um, you're out of luck. And yes, that still continues to happen today. For instance, um, here is a green bait knife that I have. And if you look at the bait knife, there are no markings on here also. Nothing anywhere saying where it was made or anything else. Uh, and it came in a plastic bag. And um, all it had on it was a sticker with a barcode on it, but the sticker gave all the information you needed to know about who actually made this knife or who it was made for uh, because uh, it was made for uh, South Bend, which is a uh, tackle company. They make all sorts of fishing supply and South Bend saw no need to actually have their name stamped on this knife anywhere. So nowhere does it actually say South Bend, but this is a South Bend bait knife. And the only way you're going to know that is if you buy it new and it's got a sticker on there that says it's a South Bend bait knife. Because once you get rid of that sticker, this is an unmarked knife. And it could have very well been the same thing with this knife. It might have came in a little package that said uh, who made it and everything else. But once you got it out of the package, all bets are off. Uh, all I can tell you is this is a much better knife than that South Bend bait knife. But at the same time, this is also a much older knife. So even uh, um, as old as it is, it's still just a rock-solid, well-made knife with beautiful brass liners and a wonderful carbon steel uh, blade, a nice brass bolster, and really nice wood handles. Uh, what kind of wood? I have no idea. And that's the way it is with some knives. Sometimes you're just not going to be able to find any real information about the knife. And you're just going to have to live with that fact. Let's move on. Now, when I was talking about the uh, picnic knives, bartender knives, and um, and uh, waiter's tools, um, I showed this knife. And a couple of people uh, mistook it for a knife by case. This is not by case. This is the Man Knife. Uh, or it was part of the Man Knife series from Rough Rider. And um, you see right here on the handle, it actually says man knives. It doesn't even say rough rider. But this was a support the cause knife. If you can see it there, support the cause. And in this case, this knife was made for um, uh, for uh, prostate cancer awareness. And it is a really nice knife. Tested approved. Doesn't say anything else on that side. Nowhere on here does it say Rough Rider, but it came in a Rough Rider, or it is a Rough Rider knife, built in the Rough Rider factory and everything else. Tested approved, and then obviously the corkscrew on the back there. Uh, it is based off of the Case Bartender knife, which in fact was built off of their uh, uh, gunstock frame jackknife, which was just two blades. And I believe the pattern first came out around 1983 in the case lineup. Obviously, these uh, Rough Rider knives uh, came out about 10 years ago, and if you notice, there was actually three different ones. They were all in some kind of Support the Cause series. Uh, the blue one, like I mentioned, was the, uh, was the uh, Prostate Cancer Awareness. 
There is also a pink one. Um, the pink did not dye nearly as well as the blue. I've thought about re-dyeing it, but I'm all right with it. And as you can tell, it's got the pink ribbon there for uh, breast cancer awareness. And then on the main blade here, you do see support to cause, and you also do see Rough Rider there. It's only on the man knives that it says man knife and not uh, Rough Rider. Otherwise, the knife is identical, except with the uh, blue handle instead of a pink handle. Again, Rough Rider. Does not say tested approved. Um, but you can see the uh, double line bolsters and everything else. And the third in the line was the From the Heart pocket knife. This one in a red smooth bone. Uh, also well made. And once again, support the cause this time in red. And obviously in Rough Rider. I think these are the only three... Um, bartender knives that Rough Rider has ever made, uh, true bartender knives. They, I mean, they do have the other one that, uh, the, uh, select barrel knife, um, uh, which is also a bartender knife, but these are the ones that were based off of the case, uh, bartender knife, the, uh, pink, uh, breast cancer awareness, the blue man knife for prostate cancer, and then the from the heart and red smooth bone. Um, and uh, kind of hard to find these days. They were made in a limited number, and the money for uh, a portion of the money for the sales of these knives went to those various uh, uh, causes. Uh, and I believe the money went to the University of Tennessee, um, their, uh, their hospital. Could be wrong on that, but it was something like that. Now, quite a few people made a comment about this big old gunboat that I showed. This is a Rough Rider gunboat, and um, that is basically Stockman-style blades on a, a canoe frame, but it is much larger than your standard canoe. And uh, as long as I'm doing this, I'll break out this one here, too. This is my uh, Cherokee Feather um, canoe with... Uh, this is one of the first uh, canoes that Rough Rider made with their um, synthetic turquoise, and I really like the bone on this one, or the turquoise on this one. The problem, from what I understand with this one, is the uh, the turquoise was very susceptible to cracking, and, um, and that's why they made a very limited number of them, and it never came back again. Um, in any case, grab that one out, mainly to compare it in size to this one. We'll talk about this knife in a little bit. Uh, and so you see a three and five eighths inch canoe compared to this uh, gunboat. And you can see it is much, much smaller. Um, even uh, the main blades here. These both have a pretty good strong pull on them. Notice the difference in the length of the main blade here. And this is an older one. This one uh, has the round shield. They also had this in a uh, a pearl handle. I regret that I did not go ahead and pick up the pearl handled one. Notice how big those bolsters are. In any case, the difference obviously is you only have two blades in the canoe: a a spear master blade and a pin blade. And in the gunboat. The much bigger gunboat you have that spear master blade you have a very big sheep foot blade going on here notice the file work going along on the back and it continues all the way into the blades um, does that on both blades the main blade too see the line up there so that's pretty cool and uh, and then you got the spade blade over here which almost looks like a little spear point but definitely a spade blade and the line up there. These were actually well made, but they are truly a pocket full. Um, as you can see here, uh, if you look at the measurement on here, I could have just told you, but this, this monster is four and a half inches long closed. And <laughs> compared to three and five eighths of an inches for a regular canoe, and there's your main blade on there. You got a three inch main blade on there 
plus all those other big blades on there. These are kind of hard to find, and when you do find them now, they are in the $50 range or more, especially if they are in uh, mint condition, uh, which this one is right now. I've never used it, but I will tell you one thing with this one. The shield did fall off at one time, and I have since um, re-glued it back on, and all I did to re-glue it back on is a little drop of epoxy. Um, unlike this one, which is an even older knife with the arrow shield, and uh, the shield never popped off on that, so you never know what the deal is with those. Um, all of these uh, Cherokee feather knives came in this big old jade box, which uh, has the knife in it. I see a little felt container in there. I've often thought of taking the felt out of there and just using the box because it's a pretty nice box. Very heavy. I don't know if this is synthetic jade. I'm guessing it is. The top does not quite match the bottom, but I definitely added to the cost and the weight of the knife. Not to mention, it was a lot of money to ship this when the person sent it to me. Um, but it's a pretty cool looking knife and a pretty cool looking box. Not something you see every day and uh, uh, another one of those things that you'll never see again. I think I've talked about this in a, in a past video on my canoes, but it's a pretty cool one. I kind of wish I would have uh, picked up a couple other knives uh, in the series, but none of the other ones really interested me. And uh, if they had had a large toothpick, then maybe things would have been different. In any case, um, there you have uh, that canoe and the gunboat. Um, again, I wish I would have gone ahead and grabbed it in pearl. Um, not crazy about the uh, the amber bone here, but you know what? I'm sure a lot of people would uh, would be more than happy with this knife if I were to give it to them. Ain't going to happen anytime soon, though. Now, as uh, long as this little doohickey was there. I saw this knife and it's like, man, that is really cool. Can I get it to focus? There we go. And uh, the guy had it for sale for $2.99. Uh, and he said it was um, a pen knife with a toothpick. And uh, I looked at it right away and I said, that's not a toothpick. That's cool. And um, it was two days before the bidding was done and it's like well i'll just watch it and see if it goes up in price because uh he was selling it i think for 2.99 and the the shipping charge was five bucks they're like man the shipping's more than a knife and it doesn't it's not i could throw this in an envelope and send this and you know i could ship this thing for 90 cents just about anywhere but anyway i wasn't too concerned about that because if you can see here and probably can't but that is um, J.A. Hinkle's, uh, Germany, Inex. And it's just a little manicure knife. And it's like, wow, I like that knife. I really want that knife. But uh, I don't want to bid early because somebody else might uh, no take a notice of it. I don't know when this knife was made or anything. I'm guessing uh, post-World War II. Uh, but really just a little nice knife. And what I liked on it is what he thought was a toothpick, which is running along the back, because this is actually a manicure knife. And, uh, well, let's get it open. And what you got back here is actually a nice little nail file with the uh, little um, uh, uh, nail cleaner tip going on right there. And I saw that and it's like, wow, that is so cool. It's a nice little stainless steel knife, nothing fancy about it. Uh, but I thought, well, if I can get that for uh, under ten bucks, I'm I'm more than willing to go for it. And uh, no one else bid on it, so I got it for the uh, two ninety nine uh, plus five dollars for shipping, and uh, I think it was well worth it. Um, nice and tight too. Nothing wobbles on this, and um, looks like it was really never actually used or anything. And the blade, see how nicely polished and everything is on there. So sometimes uh, you just look out and you see uh, something on eBay and it just goes in your uh, your direction. So I got myself a little manicure knife, a little pen knife that uh really not big at all. And, uh, well, let's see here. What is that? Yeah. 
right over two and a quarter inches long about two and three eighths of an inch is long. So about the same size as a uh, classic SD. Obviously it is lacking the scissors. And as long as we're talking classic SDs, uh, well, let's take a look at my latest Swiss Army classic SD that I just picked up also uh, in uh, an eBay purchase. Not an eBay purchase, a Smoky Mountain Knife Works purchase. I actually picked three knives up from Smoky Mountain Knife Works. Once again, I had to send one back. Hopefully, it'll be back here soon. Uh, but here is uh, one that I bought that is pretty dang cool. And, uh, well, let's get the box open. I can edit out this portion. Okay, so here we have it. It is, uh, I believe it is the Poison Dark Frog Classic SD, something like that. And I believe this is also another one of Brian Wilhoit's uh, designs. You got the uh, blue frog on top, a green frog, a yellow frog, and a red frog down there at the bottom. And if you notice, the red frog is actually in some water. It's not uh, just half of a frog there. You see there's a little blue going on down there. So it's kind of cool. I like frogs. And so that was one of the reasons I went ahead and picked it up. Backside is just the forest leaves. Uh, it would have been nice to have a, another frog on the backside, but I'm not complaining. Otherwise, it is, it is what it is, a classic SD. So you already know what you got there. You got the uh, little main blade, the uh, screwdriver tipped uh, nail file, and a pair of scissors. And let's see here. Just for giggles, two and a quarter inches or 58 millimeters versus uh, the J.A. Hinkles. And you see uh, that eighth of an inch difference uh, makes all the difference in the length of that blade too. So that, uh, that little knife has a pretty long blade going on there. Not to mention it's got a nice little teardrop shape going on. But anyway, there you have it. Uh, it would have been nice if it would have had a key ring, but that's okay. Um, my little manicure knife and my latest uh, classic SD, this time the, uh, I think it's the Poison Dart Frog uh, classic SD. Um, and as long as we're looking at uh, Victorinox knives, let me break out uh, a much older one. I am not sure if I have shown this one before or not, uh, but this is... Uh, a Swiss soldier's knife. Uh, I believe this one is from, it's an Elsen, Elsener Schweiz, so it is out of the Victorinox lineup, and it's from 1944, so definitely a World War II era um, uh, Swiss soldier's knife. It's got the little uh, proof mark down there. This is the second one I picked up. This is the first one. The proof mark was worn off on this one. Um, you can see the damage to the scales on there too, or the handles, whichever you want to call it. Um, this one, at first glance, looks better, but if you notice, there is some warpage going on with it. This one has a crack on the back, and also, if you can see there, uh, those marks are actually somebody's name, I believe, or something of that nature going across the back there. That's okay by me. Um... That's all part of the character of the knife. The blades are in excellent shape. You've got your screwdriver going on up here. And um, and then you have the can opener. And thank goodness I've got this now because I can get this can opener now open without killing my hand because these things are a bear. Um, can openers are really hard to open on all these old Swiss Army knives. It's the old style can opener. And then um, you got the nice punch going on on the back back here. Hear that snap? This thing uh, definitely seems like something that spent more time in the drawer than in a, a pocket, which is okay by me. Uh, really a, an excellent example I've got now. And uh, it really came in handy because, uh, well, here's the main blade on this one. Uh, this is, uh, what, one of their, uh, is it the 100 millimeters? Yeah, the 100 millimeter version 
of the um, Swiss soldier's knife before they went to the smaller one, which was, I believe, uh, 93 millimeters long. But here is the clip blade that came with this one. This is the first one I bought. I bought this one a couple years ago. Uh, and you can see that the blades are more of a carbon steel. You see, this one says Swiss made here. But here's the main blade on this one. It's really in sad shape. Um, Elsener Schweitz, Swiss made. And this one was from 1942. Also a World War II era one. But I bet you can tell which one of these knives got used the most. Uh, so this one uh, definitely uh, had a lot more fun in its previous life than this one did. But this one, uh, well, what can I say? It's in beautiful shape. I'm so happy to have it. And uh, I'm not going to get rid of either one of them. Uh, but it's nice to have two of the 100mm uh, Swiss Soldier knives. Especially considering this one definitely has the, uh, the proof mark and everything else. And this one, uh, well, it's the first one I picked up. Happy with both of them. All right, let's move on to something else, and uh, and then we might be wrapping this up because those fixed blade knives took a long time. Knife Chats with Tobias, in partnership with the DGE BAB Foundation, brings you this brief public service announcement. Well, yee howdy, boys and girls. It's your old pal, Yakima Bob, coming right back at you again. You remember me from that Saturday morning show, looking for Bigfoot? Well, me and Jake, we're back once again, just to remind you, if you go out in the woods alone, don't forget to bring your whistle, and don't forget to bring some water, because you might get lost, and you're going to need both of those if you're getting lost. Don't forget it now. Take it away, Jake. I was born to be alive. I was born to be alive. Take it, Jake. Born to be alive. Born to be alive. Just I was born. 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 Born to be alive. And you can't stay alive without that whistle and some water so take it from me and jake if you go in the woods bring some water and a whistle this public service announcement was brought to you by the don't get eaten by a bear foundation in partnership with knife chats with tobias you probably already saw this one and you're going to see it again real soon but this is uh one of my guilty pleasure knives this is the uh not so much the the push dagger is a guilty pleasure. I will be doing a lot more on this one pretty soon. Uh, matter of fact, yeah, real soon. I'm already currently working on the uh, the video for this. Uh, but the reason I'm bringing this out is because of the uh, Damascus on here. Um, and these are some of my guilty pleasure knives. I don't buy them that often, but I do like to pick them up. Um, and I know that for the price I'm paying, I'm not getting the world's best quality Damascus and I know a lot of people even go around saying that's not true Damascus and it's like well you know what nothing is true Damascus these days this is really a pattern welded steel just like uh, what the, the more expensive uh, Damascus is it's a pattern welded steel everyone calls it Damascus and there is definitely some top quality stuff out there however I was talking to someone in the knife industry about this uh, and they said even among the mass-produced uh, uh, names, uh, if it is a um, a budget brand, the, the the Damascus that you're going to see in those budget brand knives, uh, even in uh, some of the popular name brands, is still going to be pretty much the same as the Pakistan Damascus that you see in this knife. And um, much of the time, it's going to be more show than actual usefulness. And uh, a lot of the times, it is not going to hold the world's greatest edge. So 
just just understand that you are going to get what you pay for. So if you're paying $50 for a Damascus knife, you got a Damascus knife for $50 and it's not going to be nearly as good as a handmade Damascus knife that's going to be running into the hundreds of dollars. It's going to look great maybe, might look better than this one, but that does not mean it's going to be a top quality Damascus. So your your case Damascus is going to be a better Damascus than your Rough Rider Damascus. Your if Great Eastern were to make a knife with Damascus, it would make a much better Damascus than a Rough Rider or a Right Edge or any of those other things. And just just understand that. Um, so and quite often your Pakistani um, unnamed Damascus blade is going to be just as good as your Rough Rider or um, your Marbles or other companies like that, Damascus Blades. And that brings us to two other Damascus knives I got here. Um, this one I'm showing because somebody asked about it. They were asking where this uh, Leol was made, and I don't know. It isn't marked, so I'm assuming it was made in uh, Pakistan. And that is also why I don't refer to it as a Leol knife even though it has all the markings of a Leol knife because I don't want to get into arguments with the um, the Leol purists out there who say no the knife has to be made in Tears, France and uh, otherwise it's not a true Leol. Uh, that might be true. Um, the French government would argue with you a little bit about that. I'm not going to be the one arguing about it. What I will tell you is uh, I'm pretty happy with this knife. I believe it was made in Pakistan, and I usually refer to it as a picnic knife or a Leol style knife. I do not call it a Leol. The best I will do is say a Leol style knife um, because I think it is fair to say that because it has the B and it has all the markings of a Leol, but it is not made in France, nor is it made around the town of Leol. But... I do like the Damascus pattern on it. I like the way it looks and uh, it's got a pretty decent edge and I have sharpened it and it does seem to retain the edge. So I kind of like this knife. Uh, it's got uh, buffalo horn handles. One of them has a little bit of uh, tan streaking in it. I wish they would have all had that tan streaking in it, but uh, not a bad knife. Uh, but as with many Leol, it has also got a problem that you gotta be careful with and that is the blade hits the back spring so you do not want to just slam this shut it will make a nice loud snap but what you're really hearing is blade wrap um, so it's a pretty cool knife i do like it lines up uh, nice enough you got the uh the factory um file work going on there and for the price i paid for it i have no complaints we're talking about a knife that i paid about 20 bucks for and I uh, wish I would have said the same about this one. This is the very first Damascus knife I ever bought. And it was a Damascus fish knife. Uh, and as you can see, the blue bone does not match on each side. The rest of it is kind of close. It's definitely lighter on the front than the back. Uh, and you got the Damascus blades. Um, nickel silver bolsters going. And you got the file work on the back there. And yes, this knife, I'm almost positive, was made in Pakistan again. And notice the difference in nail necks. The quality of these knives is always suspect. But at the same time, um, well, yeah, the lineup definitely is not straight. If you can get that nail neck, which I can, opens up nice. And you got your bottle opener there and guess what it fits a bottle perfectly and this uh, this is supposed to be the fish scaler uh, and I got to tell you what I guess it could be a fish scaler but it, it has an edge on it good enough that you can actually cut wood with it mostly soft wood but you can definitely cut wood with it and this point here for the hook remover that point is very sharp I feel sorry for any fish that is going to try and have a hook removed with this blade because I got a feeling you're going to do more damage to the fish trying to remove the hook. And then, uh, well, also, again, 
You don't want to let it slam because it will give you a good piece of blade wrap. And then the main blade opening up. Main blade is a little looser, but I like the pattern on it. And uh, it's got a sharp edge too. Not too sharp, but sharp enough that it will actually cut stuff. And you got file work going on on the back of that too. So I'm, I was pretty happy with it. I've almost given this knife away a couple times. But at the last minute, I said, you know what? No, I'm going to keep this knife because uh, it is pretty cool. Sometimes I say I'm going to keep it to remind myself not to buy Damascus knives. But I know deep inside I'm keeping it because I just like this knife. And so at the end of the day, um, Damascus knives out of Pakistan just tend to be a nice guilty pleasure of mine. Um, and I'm going to just come out of the closet and say so. I, I really don't mind having a few of them around. Uh, I know what they're worth. And um, I know they're not going to go up a whole lot in value or anything like that. But that's not why I'm buying them. I'm buying them just because I look at them and I say, hey, that looks pretty cool. So I go ahead and pick it up. And uh, um, I usually don't talk about it much on the channel. Uh, but I thought I would do it now. Uh, and part of the reason I want to do that is to let you know that they're, what, what you're buying when you get them. You're, you're not getting a super deal on these knives. You're not. Um, sometimes you'll see these things listed for $40 or $50. I think that's crazy prices. Do not buy them for $40 or $50. They are knives that are worth that, uh, you know, $25 range or so, maybe less than $25. Uh, but when you start seeing them um, on eBay and they'll have a, a price of them for like $9.99 and then you look closely and it'll, it'll say uh, the shipping charge is uh, $24.99 or $30 or something like that, don't buy it. Look for a different one. Um, you will eventually find these things in the under $25 with free shipping charges. And that's usually um, where they're worth the price. If you're paying more than that, uh, maybe uh, maybe it's worth that much to you. It isn't worth that much to me. Um, in any case, uh, let's move on. I'm not gonna show this one. Uh, this is the Marbles Black Stag Bone. It is the... Uh, MR477. Right now the box is empty, but I tell you what, this is one sturdy box. I like this box. I wish Rough Rider would switch over to putting their uh, their knives in a box like this marbles box instead of the magnetic boxes they use, because this knife box is nice and solid, and it fit the knife perfectly. Uh, so it doesn't take up too much room, but really solid box. I really like it. I like it much better than the magnetic boxes. In any case, a review of this knife will be airing soon if it has not aired already. Uh, speaking of which, a very brief look at this one here. This is a Frost Family Series knife. And uh, I bought this one because I wanted another 4-inch toothpick. And this one is in Genuine Abalone. It comes in a wonderful little uh, uh, felt pouch with the little Frost family thing there and then it's in plastic but it's also wrapped in paper and uh, well you'll have to watch because eventually I will have a video of this knife as well so that was the sneak peek but you see it right there abalone frost large toothpick they said but it's really just a four inch toothpick and we'll wrap everything up with this knife here, the Zombie Nick Knife. Not the Zombie Neck Knife, I've got that already. You've probably seen it before. I had to arm wrestle, uh, skip the show to get this back from him. This is the little Zombie Nick Neck Knife, which uh, is pretty cool. You see there is a Zombie Nick. Zombie Nick. You got the little Zombie Nick shield there. I wish the handles glowed in the dark. It's just a zombie green handle. They should have made these things glow in the dark, man. They would have been really much more popular then. Comes with a nice little uh, plastic sheath. It locks in there really well. 
and it came with a little lanyard. I believe it came with the lanyard. Yeah, they came with the lanyard. I got all four of them. There's a brown one. Uh, well, let me show you. Okay, so you got the brown jig bone one. This is the one I usually go ahead and carry sometimes because, well, I don't care if this one gets messed up. I should get another one of these in case it does get messed up. And then there was one in the uh, Stonework series. I do have the, the sheath in the, the drawer, but there's the one in the Stonework series with the, the blue turquoise, the, the red jasper, and then uh, white pearl, white pearl and abalone down the middle there. That's pretty cool. And then also one in the uh, uh, Brian Yellowhorse Arrowhead series which I really like this one too. I wish it would have had the arrowhead shield on it. But those were the four neck knives they made so far in this little series. And I really wish they'd make more of them. I, I kind of like these and they're nice and small and uh, they're actually quite functional. Get two fingers on there and uh, makes just a nice little box cutter, you know, and it's nice and small. You can wear it around your neck. Doesn't take up any room. What's that say there? Friends don't let friends eat friends. Uh, and then on the other side here you got a zombie Nick and a little a zombie Nick shield going on there. Um, and, well, oh, we weren't here to talk about these, were we? I had to actually arm wrestle. Nick uh, skipped the show to get this back. He thought he was going to be able to keep it after the last uh, last month's. I ended up having to give him a different knife in order to get it back, too. I lost in the arm wrestling. That guy's stronger than I thought. In any case, here is my second zombie Nick knife. I had to go out and get the elephant toe. Um, again, the uh, the green does not glow in the dark. You got the zombie Nick shield there and the black dot blades. And, uh, well, got zombie Nick there. 40 razor sharp stainless steel man I can't see the uh, number well the numbers on the box I'm sure RR 1455 yeah that sounds about right these have been around for quite a while and they are disappearing I don't think they're in the uh, Rough Rider lineup anymore and again the friends don't let friends eat friends uh, on the blade and I bought it because I knew eventually I would look back and say, man, why didn't you buy that zombie Nick elephant toe? Uh, and for the price that I could get it for, because I only paid uh, 15 bucks for it or so, it's like, yeah, just go ahead and pick it up because you know you're going to regret it later. And um, it's it's one of those patterns I like to collect, so I went ahead and grabbed it finally. And I, I do not regret it. Uh, and I do like the box. It's a fun box. I think these were... Um, were an Andy Armstrong idea, the uh, the zombie Nick knives. I, I might be wrong, but I'm pretty certain um, this was a, a, a Andy Armstrong from Smoky Mountain Knife Work came up with this plan. Uh, and they are pretty cool. You know, it's just a fun take on the old zombie knives right at the end of the whole zombie craze, but still, still pretty cool. Any case, um, is there something else I want to talk about? Uh, we'll find out. And now for a brief word from our sponsors. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to go when the volcano blows. Actually, I know exactly where I'm going when the volcano blows. I'm going to the Volcano Club. Howdy there, all you knife chatters out there. It's your old pal Skip the Show, proprietor of the Volcano Club. And I have teamed up with Knife Chats with Tobias with a great promotion for all of you guys out there in the Knife Chats world. It's called Wet Your Whistle, Wes Whittler Wednesday. You try and say it fast. Wet Your Whistle, Whittler Wednesday. That's right. Me and Knife Chats with Tobias have teamed up with a great deal. You come into the Volcano Club on any Wednesday this summer and the first drink is on Knife Chats with Tobias. All you have to do is bring like a little Knife Chat sticker 
Well, bring yourself a Whitler knife. He says a Whitler knife looks like something like this. It's got a big blade on this side and two little blades on that side. He said this is a seahorse or something. Anyway, you bring in a Whitler on a Wednesday and your first drink is on Knife Chats with Tobias. Can't argue with that now, can you? And by the way, Knife Chats with Tobias gave me this really cool knife. It's got skulls on it and everything. But you know the best part about it is? Wet your whistle, Whitler Wednesday. It's got a bottle cap opener. It's got a bottle cap opener. Hey, one take, skip the show, that's me. See y'all soon, Knife Chatters. Don't forget, life is short and full of choices. Choose the Volcano Club. Skip out. We now return to our show. Did I have something else I wanted to show you? Actually, there are two other knives I wanted to show you. And the first is my first ever purchased um, modern folder. It was one of those uh, SAR knives or search and rescue knives. I got it from uh, KY Knives on eBay. Um, anyone who's bought budget knives on eBay probably has bought a knife at one time or another from KY Knives. I actually like the guy. Um, he's got a wide variety of knives, uh, both traditional pattern. Uh, right now he has a lot of trade in there, uh, but he used to carry a lot of Rough Riders, but he also had a lot of modern folders on there, you know, flipper knives, and that's what I bought. I bought a flipper knife from him, and it was my first modern folder ever, and here it is. I bought it because it said Army on there, and it's got the nice star there. I think I paid all of like $7 for this thing. And uh, I was actually impressed with it when I got it. And what's more interesting is uh, I would often show people my knife collection, and they say, no, this is the knife I like. You know, they didn't care about the, uh, the toothpicks. They didn't care about the Stockmans. They didn't care about any of the traditional pattern knives. They would see that, and they go, oh, that's the cool knife. And that's the one they would want. I can close it right-handed. I cannot close it left-handed uh, with one hand. I don't think I can. I guess I can. Yeah, so either way I can close it. You got the serrated portion up front there, and then you got the blade here, and then you have this uh, supposed um, seat belt cutter on the back there. Um, I thought that was going to be good for cutting fishing line and stuff, but if you see here... Here's a shoelace, and uh, let's see here, get a shoelace in there. Should I really have to pull three times just to cut a cheap cotton uh, uh, shoelace? And if I'm having to pull three times with a cheap cotton uh, shoelace, can you imagine how hard it would be to cut a seat belt with that? But uh, it's a fun knife. Um, and I keep it for nostalgia's sake, yes, nostal nostalgia's sake, because, uh, well, it's the very first modern flipper I ever bought, and, uh, it's kind of fun to flip, and you know what, uh, every time I see a much more expensive flipper knife, I can go ahead and grab this and flip it, and I get just as much joy out of this as I would probably with a modern flipper knife. And this one only cost me seven bucks, and it's a search and rescue knife. Do they still even make search and rescue knives, uh, or has people moved away from that? Um, any case, uh, it was a fun knife. Uh, aluminum anodized scales, got the wonderful star there. A blacked out 448 stainless steel blade with uh, half serration going on. Uh, flips well with both the thumb studs, dual thumb studs. And uh, and the flipper. The only negative on this is, you know, you've got a tip-up carry um, uh, pocket clip. There's no tip-down, or no, it is tip-down. A tip-down pocket carry uh, uh, pocket clip as opposed to a tip-up. But you couldn't have a tip-up because of the, uh, the uh, 
seatbelt cutter and also you've got the ooh, glass breaker there um, and the only way you're going to find out if this breaks a glass is to take it out and bash a windshield in so um, for some reason I doubt that it works very well anyway that was my very first modern folder oh and I can actually tighten the blade up by hand just by screwing it right there yeah because the blade gets loose every once in a while anyway kind of a fun knife and the other knife I wanted to show you is an antique Chinese shrimp shaped knife now this one is really interesting I picked this up for all of a buck at a flea market I have seen them selling on line on eBay as a, as a uh, genuine, authentic, antique Chinese uh, shrimp knife or something like that. Uh, and they, they try and pass them off for 5 or $10. And it's, I, I think it's, it has a back spring here, but it really feels like it is nothing more than a gravity knife. The, it, everything is nice and tight there. The spring, I guess, might be acting against it. I don't know. Uh, but you have to pull it open all the way. There's no snap in these things at all. See how you push that down. And uh, you got a blade steel of something. It basically is a... Uh, I, I would say the blade steel in these things is kind of like a butter knife kind of blade steel. Um, and... I don't know why I bought it. I saw it and it's like, oh, that's kind of cool looking. So I went ahead and picked it up. And like I said, I, I paid a dollar for it. And uh, that was probably 99 cents more than it was worth. You notice there? See the line there? Can you see that? That's where that kind of was, I guess, for the longest time. Because it took away the paint there. Anyway, I saw that and I thought, well... What the heck? I, it, it was. I, I thought I had lost it. I really did. I thought it got thrown away, or I threw it in my junk box and gave it away, or something like that. But uh, the other day, I was uh, cleaning up, and this thing showed up, and it's like, wow! I still got my shrimp knife. Uh, what's the point of it? I have no idea. But for some reason, I seriously, seriously doubt that it is a genuine antique. Chinese shrimp knife. It does have some kind of logo on there. Right there. I don't know. It looks like a rooster or something on there. Maybe somebody knows more about them than I do. But in any case, uh, maybe this will be next year's April Fool's joke. <laughs> because, uh, well, it definitely is a joke. And with that said, um, you know what I think I'm going to do? Let's take a look around uh, the shop. I haven't done that in a long time.
And that brings us to the conclusion of another exciting episode of Knife Chats with Tobias Almost Live. If you liked what you saw, give us that thumbs up and leave us a comment. We always like to hear from you here at Knife Chats with Tobias. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you'll know when the next exciting episode of Knife Chats with Tobias is up and running. But thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Hey, hey.